Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Our guest this week is a, a face that's familiar to EWTN viewers, Father Donald Calloway. He's uh, appeared on Life on the Rock and book, uh, Bookmark. He's a former Episcopalian with a very large story to tell. So I'm going to get my introduction over as soon as I can, but I want to remind you that you are an essential part of the program. The phone number for your questions is 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can give us a call at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Father Calloway, welcome to the Journey Home. It's Thank good you, to have Marcus. you here. You, you're over living near Steubenville right That's now? Right. Right That's right, right in Steubenville. Right in Steubenville. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, as I mentioned to the audience, you're, you've got a long, you know, I don't envy you right now because you're going to have to <laughs> condense your life story into right. just about 25 minutes. I will tell the audience that if you'd like to hear the full presentation of a story, that it's available on audio at least. That's right. By uh, St. Joseph's Communication. So, uh, Father Donald, let me get out of the way. Let's hear your early journey. Okay. Um, I'm glad you said that because it is hard to say in a, in a limited period of time. I've been known to go as long as two hours. So, um, I'm going to put the time on. <laughs> okay, you do that. Uh, when I was born, my uh, parents were not religious at all. I was born in 1972 to parents who were not uh, practicing any religion whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't baptized. We never went to church. We never prayed. Um, the word God in our family only came up in a, in a bad way. It was never in a reverential way. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my early upbringing. And my early home life was, was not too, too good either. My mother and father separated when I was just a baby. And my mother remarried to another gentleman who was not religious at all. And then they separated, got a divorce. And then my mother remarried for a third time uh, to a military officer. So before I was uh, 10 years old, I had three fathers. Wow. And so that was, you know, pretty uh, influential on me. Yeah, it, it really was. It, it had a big impact on me. But the, the thing that happened when I was 10 years old, when my mother married uh, this military officer, he adopted me, so I got his last name, Calloway. And he was an Episcopalian, but only in name. He never went to church, uh, didn't really have anything to do with, you know, religion. But uh, when they got married, they thought it would be a good idea to have me baptized. And so I was baptized when I was 10 years old, mm -hmm. uh, a valid baptism in the uh, Southern Virginia Episcopalian Church uh, when I was 10. However, just to show you the, the effect that it had and the meaning that it had, my introduction into the life of grace, of the Trinity, and of the hope of heaven, how profound was it for the family? It wasn't. We, we don't have one photograph from my baptism. <laughs> I don't remember any instruction uh, in preparation for baptism or anything, because I was 10, I you know, mm -hmm. could have had some, I would have remembered it. All I remember from this, you know, sacrament were the jelly-filled donuts afterwards. <laughs> my introduction into the life of grace consisted of donuts. That's all that I remember. After my baptism, my uh, stepfather, my dad, I call him dad now, I love him dearly, uh, military officer, we started to move a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, as a military family, if people know you move a lot, sometimes too much. We never went to church in any of these moves. Never uh, crossed, you know, the door of a church. Never talked about God. These were foreign ideas to me. I never really even considered myself a Christian. If somebody would have asked me when I was 12 years old, are you a Christian? I wouldn't have known what, known what to say. Hmm. Uh, it didn't mean anything for us. Well, one of the first moves that we made as a family was to Southern California. And I was about 11 years old didn't believe in God, didn't know really right from wrong, uh, didn't know there were eternal consequences to my actions. <laughs> Went to Southern California in the early 80s, and there was a big shift going on. MTV started uh, at that time, and I really bit onto the cultural religion, so to speak. And so I started to watch mu music. Mm -hmm. Now you couldn't just hear it, you could see it, and you could see what they were actually singing about in these songs through MTV and so forth. And living in Southern California, it was tough being young. That whole thing sounded like a recipe for disaster. Oh, it was. With your background. That it was. The family to go there and yeah. let, let you loose. Exactly. And so when I was 12 years old, I started looking at things that no human eye should see. You know, the, the filth that's out there and the, and the pornographic images everywhere, all of that. You know, I was being shown those things. I was being introduced to drugs at that early age. 
and this whole mentality of just rebellion and, and anti-authority and all of these kinds of things. And I bit onto that. I, I, I actually liked it. And the television programs that I was watching, you know, I wanted my goal in life, and I'm, I, I'm shameful to say this, was three's company. You know, to one guy living with two beautiful women has a commitment to neither one. You know, that was my ideal in life was to imitate the people on TV. Well, after our, our time in the Los Angeles area, we moved down to San Diego, which is like the crown jewel of mm -hmm. Southern California, and I loved it. I fell in love with San Diego. Couldn't get enough of it. And uh, we weren't there too long. And it, during that time, I was going to the beach all the time. You know, for a young boy who was seeing all these things, it was just a place to be. But that was pulled out from underneath me when my, my dad came home one day and announced to the family that we were going to move again. And I thought to myself, you know, where? You know, Malibu, are we going to go to Honolulu? You know, we had gone from Virginia Beach area to L.A. to San Diego. It just kept getting better. Well, what he said shocked me. He said, we're going to move to Japan. <laughs> well, I, I freaked out. I mean, I flipped. And I thought to Did myself, you with you? no, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> I was just learning at that time, actually, how to surf. And now I'm actually getting back into that a little bit. Um, so I, I rebelled. I thought to myself, everything that I've come to think that life is worth living, you know, being in S Southern California, America's finest city, you know, San Diego, now it's being taken away from me. And I have to go where they don't speak English, you know, I didn't think. I didn't know what I was going to be doing over there. I, I completely lost it, but I had to go. I was just a young kid. So when we went, I went into full swing rebellion over there. And I immediately looked for the kids who were wearing the Ozzy Osbourne t-shirts, the girls who were poorly dressed because I knew what that meant. They didn't have any self-worth or dignity and it was, you know, availability. And I got into the wrong crowd immediately. I started using drugs that I didn't have the opportunity to use in San Diego, Southern California. And really started living a really bad life, a really bad life. Eventually stopped going to school over there. And then after about two years of living this kind of lifestyle, I just decided that I, I wanted to leave. So I ran away from home with another military dependent. Uh, uh, his parents were in the military. Left on the main island of Honshu, the big island, and started to live my own kind of life. And I was only not even 16 years old. Could you speak Japanese? No, not anything that I could say now. Uh, only the bad stuff. Yeah. You don't want to do it on no, TV I, no, don't worry. Uh, so how how could you survive there in, with English? Do they speak English pretty freely? Or? Uh, yeah, they, so a lot of them do. Okay. And I was a cute little Caucasian boy that many people found you know cute, and so they would warm up to me. And I was a manip manipulator, a liar, a deceiver. I could get whatever I wanted. And so and I ran away with another military dependent. He knew a little bit more Japanese than I did. But we were living a crazy life. You know, we were living um, sleeping all day in these capsule hotels because we were running from the police, you know, because of the crime that we were committing. Literally, we were committing felonies, what are felonies here in the United States, mm -hmm. major criminal activity over there. And I was causing an international scene. It was, uh, it was unbelievable what I was doing between the governments, the military. I was wanted and, and running free in Japan, committing felonies. And eventually, they apprehended me and my friend who, who had run away. And I was able, because I was as quick as, you know, lightning at that time in my life, and I was able to uh, break free of the brig. You know, I was put in a military uh, confinement kind of place. I was able to get out of that, ran loose. They caught me again. When they apprehended me the second time, I was told that my mother had already left the country because they told her, my mother that she had to leave with my younger brother, Matthew, uh, my half-brother, Matthew. They had to leave the country to prepare a place uh, when they found me dead or alive, basically. So when I was apprehended the second time, they weren't taking any chances. They handcuffed me to military police officers, big, huge men, uh, on my left and on my right. And then when I was deported, literally I was kicked out of the country of Japan, uh, literally, uh, they had to handcuff me to the plane. That's how bad I was, because they knew I was so violent, and I was. I was taking swings at people, if you were within distance, to take a shot at, I would. They were thinking about duct tape in my mouth, because I was so foul, I would you know, spit on people. That's just, I was an animal. And they knew that I could do people harm on a plane. And this was a commercial flight. So we flew to Honolulu, and I was handcuffed the whole time. We had to walk through to change planes in Honolulu, and what a sight. I mean, I, here I am, not even 16 years old, long hairs growing. I was started growing my hair long, had an earring, dressed like a, a Martian. You know, my clothes look like I came from another is planet. Is this the picture that we have possibly? Or is That's it? a little later, oh, but okay. it's close. Okay. It, it's building up to that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, and so I was just 
you wouldn't believe, I mean, to see me then and to see me now is completely different. So I'm walking through the airport, and the people are obviously looking at this young man coming through, handcuffed to military police officers. And what was I doing? I was yelling at them profanities in the airport because I didn't care. So then we flew to LAX, and they let me go because I didn't do any crimes in this country, and they weren't going to prosecute me. But the deal was I had to enter into an institution, a rehab, but I had a lot of problems. I had a lot of issues. I had drug issues. I had social issues. I had all kinds of issues. So I went to this institution unwillingly. I didn't want to go, but I went, and it was in Pennsylvania. And their intention was to make me sober, to get me better. But I didn't want to be there, so I didn't cooperate. I used drugs in, in the rehab. And their method was so laughable, I just thought it was silly. Their, their method of trying to help me get sober was every night we would go out and sit around a campfire, make s'mores, and sing affirmation songs to each other. That's what we would do. That was their, their secular method of sobriety. And I just laughed at it. I thought, even if I was interested, this just ain't going to work. You know, it doesn't, I can't believe you guys are getting paid to do this. And I, I, I left. I actually ran away from the rehab, got caught in a cornfield somewhere in Pennsylvania. They brought me back. The day I got out, I relapsed. I went right back into the same lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Ended up moving back in with my parents who had relocated to um, Berks County, uh, Pennsylvania. It's near Reading, the city of Reading, Pennsylvania. And I continued the same lifestyle. Tried to go back to school, but never did. Uh, I don't have a high school diploma to this day. Never graduated from high school. Ended up leaving home because I couldn't stay at home. Uh, living in a confined area where I had to show some responsibility just didn't work for me. Ended up leaving, and that's when uh, my hair, the picture, the picture there. yeah, is <laughs> in, the, in, in the back. When it was wet, it went all the way down to my belt. That's how long it was. I had grown it for about six years straight and uh, didn't even cut it. I had the worst split ends you could possibly imagine at that point. <laughs> Uh, but I was just wanted to be free, wanted to actually be like a retro hippie, wanted to go back and live off the land and all those kinds of things. So I left home and I came about this close uh, in my life to religion as I ever did yeah. because I, was, I became a deadhead of uh, the Grateful Dead. I mean, it was this close to being a religion uh, because they, there was some kind of cosmic togetherness and, you know, we all shared a form of communion, but it wasn't holy communion. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we had a cup that we shared, but it was usually, you know, alcohol, uh, a, a Budweiser or s such. <laughs> and at that time, I thought, well, this is real brotherhood. You know, this is where I feel uh, united with, with something that is more than myself. I even got a tattoo of the Grateful Dead on my shoulder, which I, which I still unfortunately have. Uh, it's called Steal Your Face, which is appropriate at that time because I was dead, no doubt about that. And I was living this crazy life, and I found myself in Louisiana when I turned 18 at Mardi Gras time, got thrown in jail um, at that, right after I turned 18. To my great shame, I got caught shoplifting from a store called Piggly Wiggly. So, uh, you know, no honor in my life of uh, madness. So then I got out of jail, left the state on a uh, wanted, you know, they're tracking me down, and I'm just paranoid. My life is just paranoid. Ended up going back to my parents. You know, I'm wondering, are you getting in trouble for saying all this stuff on TV? No, <laughs> no. All that's the past. You're not yeah. looking at, looking for you. No, all that's cleared up by the grace of God. There we yeah, go. we'll get to okay. that in a second. Half. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I go back to stay with my parents because I had nowhere else to go. Uh, I went back with them, and not by my own choice, I found myself. I woke up one morning in another institution. Because at that point in my life, I was doing heroin, crack, LSD, mushrooms, uppers, downers, alcohol, marijuana, all of that stuff, almost daily, those things. Well, I woke up one morning after doing so much crack that I almost died, strapped to a gurney in an institution. And I stayed in that institution under lock and key for a good part of a summer. Mm -hmm. But it, that didn't work either. I didn't want to be there. When I got out, same things. My parents at that time, my father was still in the military and they were gonna relocate down to Southern Virginia. 10 years, a decade had gone by mm -hmm. since I had been baptized when I was 10 in that mm -hmm. very same location in the United States. So they asked me, do you wanna go with us? And I thought, great, you know, I can get away and try and maybe start, get a job or something. Well, I went with them, I got fired from a couple jobs, I got involved with girls, my life was crazy. The Grateful Dead were there too, and you know, it was, it was madness. And then I turned 20 and I had what I can only describe as a crisis of being, an existential crisis. I, I didn't know why I was here. I tried everything pleasurable in life uh, with women, with drugs, with music, with anything you know I could get my hands on, any sensual satisfaction. 
and it all came up lacking every time. And I felt that I don't want to live anymore. I don't understand what's going on with my existence. Nothing makes any sense to me. And I sat in my parents' house in Norfolk, Virginia, wanting to die. Hmm. I had nothing to live for. And my friends that night that I had met down there since I had been down there and it wasn't long, were calling and they were saying, you know, come on out. We're going to go down to the beach. You know, this girl's waiting to see you and we've got an eight ball of, you know, cocaine and all these things. And, and I was just like, no, I'm not going out tonight. Mm -hmm. And they thought I was nuts. And so did I. Because I wasn't waiting for a revelation of, you know, Jesus. I wasn't waiting to, to be saved or anything like that. I thought, I just don't want to live anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. This is an endless cycle that never satisfies me. And looking back on it now, it was almost as though I had lived my life by somebody else's uh, rules as far as like the music industry. Like I would pursue music as though it were my creed. And I would, I would just go in search of it. And as soon as I wore out an album because I listened to it too much, somebody's always going to be cranking out another album to feed my addiction to this secular mm -hmm. religion, so to speak. And the same thing with drugs. But with drugs, the more you do, the more you have to do to feel the effects. And I, I saw the carrot in front of me no longer worth pursuing. And the same thing with women. Women are awesome. But I, I came this close also to deifying the feminine because of the generation that I grew up in, uh, you know, with the pornographic just everywhere, inundating everything, it really messed up my manhood. It messed up my emotions and how I saw women and viewed them. And so I came to the realization that I don't have anything to live for. There's no God. There, there's, there's no, these are concepts. These are ideas that are not real. Sad to say, at that time, I was listening to bands that went by the name of Judas Priest. Yeah. I didn't even know who Judas was. I didn't know what a priest was, you know. And now I can look back on those things, and I look at the lyrics, and I think, what was I thinking? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't thinking. I was completely brainwashed and duped by the culture. My babysitter was television. Let me ask you another question with that. You said you were duped, so you're talking on a mental mm. issue. Your conscience, right? as you look back, was your conscience completely seared, or were there aspects of your conscience where you were still kind at times, or thoughtful, or sensitive, or yeah. was it? Right, that's a good question. I, I would have to say it wasn't completely dead, but it Any was- sense of guilt at all in there? There were times, there were times. One of the strongest senses of guilt from that time was my brother was the cutest little kid you ever saw. Just a, the cutest little thing. And I remember him coming up to me all the time, wanting me to play with him. And I remember I'd just push him off, or I, I'd shove him away. And that hurt. I, I would think about it later, and that, that would sting me on a conscience level. But I didn't know what conscience was. I would try to make up in another way by renting a video game with him and try and make up for it by doing something that he liked to do. So I had something of a conscience left, but it was not formed. It was not in any way formed by divine revelation. It was purely a pleasurable conscience kind of thing. Um, well, I know what I'm, I'm going to ask you now, you know, what opened your heart to the church, but are you seeing also, though, that this particular experience that you were going through, through was God set up? Absolutely. To oh, help you open to His church? Absolutely. For, for some divine reason and a divine plan, He allowed me. You didn't like it. He allowed me to go, on, go through all that I went through in my life up to that point for a reason. I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. But He was literally going to come into my life with what I call divine detox, with the divine two-by-four, and He was just going to bam. Why don't you go ahead and okay. tell us that. I, when I was 20, sitting in my parents' room, I, I wanted to die. And yet I was so, <laughs> I was scared of death. You know, I mean, that means I lose everything. And where do I go? Is it, do we really just, it's over? And so I sat there and the phone call stopped from my friends and I got bored. For the first time in about a decade, <laughs> there was silence. And silence freaked me out because you can't hardly go anywhere in this world right now mm -hmm. without music being pumped into your head. Mm -hmm. I can't go to an airport now, just like you can, as, without hearing the news. You don't have a choice. Right. You can't eat in a restaurant. Without, you can't shop in a grocery store. You cannot go anywhere without having something filtered into your head. And so for the first time in 10 years, I had silence, and I panicked. I really, the silence was screaming at me. Mm -hmm. And so I went out into the hallway, my parents' hallway, to look at like a National Geographic, you know, something, <laughs> to occupy my mind with pictures. I didn't want to read anything, I wanted to look at pictures, maps, you know. And so I went out there, and they didn't have any. They always had that. 
But I found this one book that they had that I didn't understand. It was about something called Marian apparitions. <laughs> don't know what Marian is, don't know what apparitions are. And yet, I had, I had done the whole Leonard Nimoy kick with In Search Of and Bigfoot, you know, Sasquatch, the uh, Loch Ness thing, you know, that stuff always fascinated me. So I thought this was one of those kind of, you know, books. So I took it out, went to my room, and I looked at the pictures which were in the middle, and I saw things that were beyond my comprehension. Little children looking up into the air at nothing. And I read the captions, and it said things like, the Blessed Virgin Mary is now appearing to the children. And I'm like, what is a blessed? A vir virgin? I, I, don't, I don't know what that is. You know, I, I have never associated with this kind of thing. You know, I, I knew the word, but it was foreign to me. Mary, never heard of her. Never heard of her. Um, and that's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. People have asked me that. How, how did you not know? I did not know. Mm -hmm. And so I started at the beginning of this book because I wasn't going anywhere. And I didn't understand it at the beginning. The Catholic lingo was, if you don't know Catholic lingo, right. you're lost, <laughs> completely lost. And so I'm, I'm trying to read this book to the best of my ability. And all that I'm figuring out is there's this beautiful woman, and I was always captivated, captivated by beautiful women, so I stuck with the book, you know. <laughs> God's going to work, you know. In the way that your heart has fallen, he's going to use the exact same bait to get you back. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, but where is she? I can't see her. They say they're seeing her, but I can't see her. And there's a beautiful statue of this beautiful woman, but I know that's not her. So what's, what's up here? This is crazy. I'm the one who did the drugs. These little kids living in some foreign country, they're obviously not doing drugs at this age. What's going on? So I kept reading. And then I learned about these concepts I'd always heard, always heard of. Heaven, hell, right, wrong, sin, darkness, you know, Lucifer, all these things. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I mean, everybody knows that stuff's not true. You know, that's what I thought. It's, it's a myth. You know, I, in my classes in school, when I went to school, my teachers told me this stuff is just, you know, it's for the weak. This isn't something you actually put your life into. And so I kept reading it, and the words of this woman, this Blessed Virgin Mary, who was not God, but was just such, seemed to be such a wonderful person, a creature, just so amazing. I, these messages were just so powerful that it started to really penetrate my heart. Mm. And I kept reading, and I kept reading, and I kept reading. And one of the messages said, and I needed to hear this one probably above all, because mm. I didn't think I could change, even with something like this, even mm. if it were true, you don't know me. I am filthy, sick, perverted, foul, disgusting, and I knew that about myself. Mm. I can't change. And so one of these messages said, you don't have to change to love me. Loving me will change you. I never knew that kind of love. And I thought to myself, you know, I've always heard that love changes everything. And if this is true, if this is the way that this heavenly love is, I'll give it a go. And so I consumed that book that night. I read the whole thing, didn't sleep at all. And uh, I tell my mother in the morning my experience, and she, she didn't believe me. She thought, because I wanted to talk to a Catholic priest immediately, because that's what they said in the book you had to do. You know, you have to talk to a Catholic priest. And so I wanted to do that. My mother was like, yeah, right, you know, <laughs> whatever. Because uh, I tried everything else to get her off my back, you know. So I went and talked to a Catholic priest totally freaked him out. You know, I came in there with my long hair. I mean, I looked like a freak as like, you wouldn't, I mean, the way that I looked, it was, saw the picture. yeah, yeah, that, that's a good picture. That's one of the few my mother didn't get rid of. Uh, so I went to a, this Catholic priest and he was just blown away. I mean, his face was Cro-Magnon when I was telling him my past. I basically was making a non-sacramental confession to the poor man. I mean, he was just like, I, yeah, I don't know what to tell you, you know. Uh, and this is on a military base. So that began my introduction into Catholicism, and I, I started to literally live in the church. Uh, he gave me gifts. He gave me a crucifix, a picture of John Paul II, who I didn't know who that was when he gave it to me. I thought it was a picture of his grandfather. I did. I had no idea who this guy in white was. I was raw data with Catholicism. I didn't know anything. And he gave me a picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which I knew that that was Jesus. So I took these home, and my conversion was rather quick, the, the immediacy of it, the honeymoon stage of just going through the romance with God, of just having truth just put in your, front of your face and knowing that this is freedom. This is, this is what it's all about. And my conversion was just so quickly that people couldn't believe it. My parents couldn't believe it. My friends couldn't believe it. So much so that they all left me, all of them. They all abandoned me, every single one of them. 
And I found myself so repulsed by my former life that I literally went into what I call my little hermit stage, where I literally would just go into the church as soon as it opened in the morning, and I would pray my heart out. I would get money from my mother, because I didn't have any money, and I would buy flowers for Our Lady statue and put them in front of her statue, and I love you, I give my life to you. And by the grace of God, uh, you know, if you've ever met a, a devout Catholic Filipino woman, you know <laughs> you're going to be praying the rosary within a week if you don't know how to pray it, you know. <laughs> so it wasn't long after that that God sent five Filipino women into my life. You know, it wouldn't take just one for me. It took five. <laughs> they taught me how to pray the rosary. They taught me about the scapular. They taught me about uh, St. Louis de Montfort. You know, gave me copies of all these books about saints, writings of the popes, all these things. You know, I was reading about martyrs, and I was like, this is what it's all about. I mean, this, this Catholicism unlocks the mystery of being, basically. Because I, I went through my crisis of being, and Catholicism was, like, given to me, and I wasn't even looking for it. And it unlocked everything that I was looking for, every satisfaction. Everything that I wanted that was beautiful, I found in Catholicism. Everything that I wanted that was calling me to something outside of myself, which I had sought in the Grateful Dead, you know, looking at the stars at night, tripping out with my buddies, which never lasted. Now I had the hope of paradise, of an eternity with the beautiful, with the good, the true, the holy. And I mean, it just blew me away every day. I was being blown away by the mysteries that were being, I was discovering in Catholicism. I couldn't get enough of it. They had to kick me out of church, <laughs> literally. I'd be the one that the, they'd be closing the doors and I would have to leave. And I would, most times when they'd close the doors, I'd still stay facing where I knew the tabernacle was because I knew Jesus Christ was truly present there, body, blood, soul, and divinity, just in love. Were you getting most of your catechesis through your reading? Or was, was there somebody actually giving you verbal communication? Uh, both. Yeah, the Filipino were ladies were, oh, okay. they saw me as prey, you know. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> they, I mean, they threw everything at me. They did. I mean, they had me reading stuff that I wouldn't be able to comprehend for a long time after that. But it was, it was them. And then it was my own prayer life, just going heart to heart, you know, deep calling upon deep and just discovering things, having, you know, things come to my mind that it was really God was just revealing things to me. And then the good priest there, a military chaplain, led me through things that greatly helped me. Um, I didn't even know what a spiritual director was at that time, but that's essentially what, what he was doing because I, I was so zealous. I said, Father, I'm going door to door until Jesus comes back. I don't care what I do. If I eat crackers, I've been a hippie. I know I've lived off of Doritos and Mountain Dew. I don't eat anything. I'm going to go door to door and tell people about Jesus, Mary, the Catholic Church, and the sacraments and all of that. And he had to slow me down. You know, he had to say, slow down. You know, you can't, that's good, but you need to kind of get tame, <laughs> you know, because I was wild. I'm extreme by nature. So um, thank God that he put a, a good priest, you know, in my life to, to kind of... Uh, lead me in the right direction. Father, we're going to pause there. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to try to figure out how you got from there to that collar. All right. We'll find that just a little bit. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest is Father Calloway, and uh, I took a break right in the middle of the story, but before we go on, uh, we have a unique experience here in The Journey Home this evening. We always have live guests, and, uh, live audience. We don't let you see them every week, but this week we have a bumper crop, uh, <laughs> and you might get a chance to see the audience tonight. The reason is, of course, this is the continuation of EWTN's 26th anniversary family celebration, and many were able to to stay over for the program. And if you didn't have the great privilege of being here this last weekend to see the celebration, well, it's available on DVD, I think an audio. If you go to the religious catalog, ewtnreligiouscatalog.com, you can uh, order the 
tapes from the wonderful weekend. It was a great time that we had together. You might give us a call also if you want information. That's 1-800-854-6316. That's the phone number for the catalog. It was a great weekend and a great privilege, I felt, to be a part of it with all of you. I was glad that you came for the weekend. All right, Father, I left them hanging. Right. Because you heard that whole story, <laughs> and then you have this infused yeah. change of life by God's grace, right. and somehow it got you to a collar. That's right. And that's even more of a surprise given your background. That's Talk right. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, um, let me just back up for a second because sure. some people might be asking, how did that book get in the house? You yes. know, let me back up and just say that when I was in Japan doing all the crazy things that I was doing before I got deported, my mother basically had a cri her own crisis of motherhood because she mm -hmm. was in such pain for her son, myself, who was creating yeah. this international scene and madness, that my mother, uh, by the grace of God, met a friend, a Filipino woman, <laughs> I tell you, who introduced her to Catholicism. And so my mother, who's pretty much full-blooded Italian, how she wasn't Catholic in the first place is odd, you know, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so my mother fell in love with Catholicism, but couldn't continue it in Japan. Now, I didn't know any of that because I had run away. Mm. Well, when she relocated to Pennsylvania, she continued that discovery of Catholicism and she went through the process, and she, my dad, my, my stepfather, my dad, and their son, my brother, Matthew, they all became Catholic. <laughs> and that's why I couldn't stay with them when I was going through my rebellion, following the Grateful Dead, all that, because every time I went home, I mean, there were statues all over the house. <laughs> there were cru crucifixes everywhere. They were going to church every Sunday. They were nice all of a sudden. Before, they, had, they weren't like me, but, you know, they... They weren't saints at that side, point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but now they were working on being saintly. And I couldn't stand it because I, w I didn't want any of that. And they were praying before everything they ate. And it was like, what, what's going on in the house here? So I had to leave. So my mother was consuming Catholicism. My dad was consuming it and all of that. My brother was going to Catholic school. So they were buying books and all that. So they, ha they had become Catholic two years uh, before I did. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 20, when I had my crisis, by the grace of God, um, my mother had these books in the hallway on the bookshelf, not knowing that I would ever read them, but God did, and Our Lady did. Yeah. And so when I discovered that book, that was the initial, you know, um, gift that I was given to discover Catholicism. And so, as I said before, I went, started going to church every day, and I didn't know what to do. I, I, all I knew was I was madly in love with God, with the church with Our Lady, with, with what's good, true, and beautiful. I, but I had no direction of what's my vocation in life. Mm -hmm. And by the grace of God, I, in my conversion, which I received a miraculous conversion of healing from, you know, all of my past wounds, from substance abuse, from my wounded, amazing. yeah, I mean, I should not be here. I, I mm -hmm. should not. And my, my wounded manly heart, you know, from all those years of just being sick and foul and disgusting, God was, you know, creating me a new creation. Mm -hmm through my conversion, and um, yet I didn't have any direction. What do I do with the rest of my life? And so, <laughs> who was it that helped me to discern? The Filipino women. I was say. <laughs> they would come out to me in church because they would see me there. I would be there more than them, and that's saying a lot, you know, because they're there all the time, you know. <laughs> and so, they would come up to me and they would say, you know, you would make a very good priest. And I thought to myself, you're nuts. You know, they'll never let me near a seminary. Is when they see my resume, you know, of past indiscretions, they're, they're going to be like, there's no way. And some did do that. I made some in initial phone calls to vocation directors, and I wish I had recorded those things. <laughs> because I would tell them my past, and I wasn't Catholic at this point. I still was not Catholic. And I would tell them, Father, I, I, I think I might be, be called to be a priest. And they would say, well, tell me, you know, who are you? And I would tell them the good stuff first. I'm not dumb, you know. <laughs> so I would say, well, I'm a son of a military officer. I've lived in foreign countries. I've, you know, I've done this. And it sounded great, you know, until they said, yes, tell me more. Tell me more. And I would say, well, I actually got kicked out of that country. And I've been in two rehabs. I never finished high school. I've actually been homeless, too, following the Grateful Dead. And I got a tattoo um, I'm going to be cutting my hair, and uh, I'm not Catholic, you know. And they, you would just hear like, oh, you know, and then, well, God bless you. We'll pray for you. Click, you know. And that was discouraging. Uh, but I kept praying, praying, and 
I sent out uh, these little postcards to all different com religious communities because I felt called, if I was called to the priesthood, I really felt called to It wasn't to with that picture. What's that? It wasn't with that picture. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> by no means, no way. I hid that for a while. <laughs> um, so I sent out all these uh, postcards to communities because I, I knew I was called to some kind of uh, fraternity, like a communal type living where I would have accountability and I, I need that. And so I got tons of responses back. And I didn't know what to do. I was overwhelmed. And I was so in love with Our Lady because uh, I think it's St. Bernard who says that the ways that a man sins are the ways that a man will be purified. Mm. Well, because I had so abused uh, the feminine and, and, and taken you know, advantage of, of women, God knew that he had to ravish my heart and bring me back to himself, and really for the first time, through beauty. And so it was through Our Lady that I came to Jesus, to the church, mm. to my manhood. I mean, it, God, through the mediation of Our Lady, was what helped me to become a man again, mm. you know. And so I knew that in my vocation, if I was called to be a priest, I had to be a Marian priest, totally consecrated to Our Lady. So with those postcards I got back, I just immediately said, and not a good way to discern, but, uh, you know, I was naive. I said, well, this one doesn't have Our Lady's name in it, Chuck, you know. <laughs> and anyone that had Our Lady's name in it, I kept those. And there's a substantial stack that I ha still had. So I said, what do I do? So I said, I'll send, I'll reply to the ones that have Our Lady's name in it twice. And then I came upon this one that said, the congregation of Marians of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, three times. So I was like, cha-ching, you know, that's the one. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about them. I mean, I had no idea who these guys were. So I went to visit them in uh, Washington, D.C., have a house there, and I just, these guys were great, you know, in love with Our Lady, faithful, orthodox. Uh, you know, everything was just the way that I needed it to be. You know, the tabernacle was in the middle of the chapel. I was just like right on. Um, statues were there. You know, it was just a great bunch of guys. And I just fell in love with them and uh, the, their history and their spirituality. And they were also the priests that are the Divine Mercy priest. Mm. And I'm like the poster child for Divine Mercy. You know, <laughs> I'm like Exhibit A. Exactly. It works, you know. <laughs> it, it, it's, he's true to his promises. And when I found that out, I was like, this is a perfect match. I mean, I need to be an apostle of Divine Mercy. And these are the priests that have basically been entrusted with that message globally. Mm. And so I was like, this is it. And I mean, I was so childlike in it. I didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> And so I came back home. I actually called my mother from Washington, D.C. and said, Mom, if they let me stay here right now, can you send my stuff? You know, that's how zealous I was, you know, at that time. And the vocation director told me, no, you actually have to go home again and pray about it, and we will pray about it too to see if it's a fit and so forth. And they told me. They said, point blank, um, if we accept you, it's probably going to be a miracle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I didn't want to hide anything, so I told them my past. And at that point, I had... Uh, been Catholic. I went through the you know proper procedures. I'd only been Catholic for maybe five months, something like that. And they said, look, this is going to be a lot that we're going to have to take in and pray about and all that. And I applied and I was accepted. Hmm. And they told me, your journey is going to be long and hard because you're going to have to get your basic education again. Hmm. Till the time that you're going to be a priest is going to be about 10 years. And that's a long time. And so I joined and went through the whole process of my studies, went to community college first, which was a pain. Uh, I couldn't stand it, you know. I, I didn't care one iota about math, you know, and yet I had to do this to, to get into seminary and so forth. And then my community, uh, God spoiled me, I'm telling you, he spoiled me. Joined a great community, and then in 1997, my community moved, opened up a house in Steubenville, Ohio. There is no greater place I wanted to be to get formed as a Catholic. And so I ended up going to Steubenville, to Franciscan University, I took Scott Hahn for every class he taught. I took uh, Dr. Mark Miravalli for Mariology. Yep. I mean, just soaked it up. I mean, I was just like, who, why are you doing this to me, God? I mean, you're like spoiling me with so many graces. I met so many wonderful people. And then I went to the seminary in Washington, D.C. Our Marian house is in Washington, D.C., but we go to the Dominican House of Studies for our seminary, which is a very great. good seminary, very great. very great guys, and just had some really great years there. And then uh, made my, my I, I like to say, my three arch enemies in life, I freely professed poverty, chastity, especially chastity, and obedience. I made them of my own free will mm -hmm. for life. I was, then I was ordained a deacon. And when I got to preach, oh, man, it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, it was just because I, 
I found myself coming into Catholicism and into holy orders at a time when there was some need for some preachers, yeah. you know, preaching the truth in black and white and just saying it and not caring if, you know, how it's going to be taken, but knowing that as a preacher, you have to have a message that stings, just like if you want to catch fish, that hook better have a sharp point. Mm -hmm. You got it. That's how you catch fish. You know, you get it in. Mm -hmm. And every fish fights. It's okay. It's what they do. Mm -hmm. But when they wear themselves out, you know, you reel them in and you throw them in the boat, you know, the truth, the Catholic Church. And so I knew, I, I mean, I just, this is what I was called to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And the 10 years was, was worth it, but it was tough. Then I was ordained, you know, into the priesthood. And my first assignment as a priest uh, was in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Wow. Because my community built it. You know, yeah. we're the ones who own it. We, it's our provincial headquarters in the yeah. United States. And so my first year of priesthood was being an apostle of mercy at the Shrine of Mercy. And then after that, and it just gets weirder, I'm telling you, <laughs> my superior calls me in after I've been a, a priest for one year and says to me, um, I need to ask you something. Are you willing to move to Steubenville and be the house superior? And I thought to myself, am I hearing this right? I mean, I've been a priest not even a year, and you want me to be the superior of, of the house? And he said, pray about it. And I said, okay, yes, I will. <laughs> you know, because I love Steubenville. I just can't get enough of it. It's just great. So I moved there. And then while I was there, I took classes in Dayton, Ohio, at the International Marian right. Research Institute, mm -hmm. and got a licentiate summa cum laude uh, there, and I've been living in Steubenville since 2004 as the house superior, vocation director, and traveling, speaking, trying to bring in a good catch for our Lord and Our Lady. Definitely the title to your journey is 180 degrees. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 180 degrees, yeah. all yeah. by the grace and mercy of God. That's right. Which is like you said, you're the poster boy for God's mercy. I mean, <laughs> what a great example. We've got some phone calls and emails. Let's first go to our first call, Michael from Ohio. Hello, Michael, what's your question? Hello, Marcus and uh, Father Calloway. Hello, I'm Michael. I actually live in Steubenville right now and used to live near where you lived, uh, Father Calloway. My question is, obviously, young Catholic men my age right now, I'm 17, about to turn 18, um, desire good relationships with women, but sometimes feel like there's, you know, that the only perfect one for me and for other men my age is God. Um, how do I discern the priesthood and what kind of things can I do to, to really consider it? Thank you, Michael. Sure. Well, I would say, first of all, I think I, I, I can honestly say that most of us young men uh, in this time, we are wounded uh, from the culture. It's, it's hard to escape uh, the, the stuff that's out there that's deformed us as men. Uh, but don't let that discourage you in your relationships with women. By all means, don't abandon uh, them or, or think less of them. Um, go to Our Lady. Go to Our Lady with, in your manhood, in your wounded manhood, in your relationships with all women. Go to Our Lady and ask her to help you. And in your discernment, if you believe that you're called, the answer again is go to Our Lady. She will strengthen you in your discernment and give you the clarity to know uh, if her divine Son, our Lord, is calling you uh, to be a priest. Very good. Let's take our next caller. Uh, this is Lloyd from Arizona. Hello, Lloyd. What's your question for us tonight? Well, um, I have a question about uh, repentance. What is the significance of repentance in the Catholic religion? I was an altar boy. Uh, I went to Catholic school. I never really heard it. You know, I'm not a practicing Catholic now, but it's just the stuff that I've done, like Father Calloway said, what he's gone through. I'm not as uh, bad a person as that, but I've done some bad things. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thanks for being honest. I appreciate that. I think uh, repentance is daily, uh, yeah. even now. I, I went through my honeymoon stage with God. I definitely did that. It was wonderful. But even now, I'm in that daily process of conversion. Repentance, it's ongoing. Uh, the just man sins 70 times a day. And our Lord who says, if your brother sins against you, you know, 70 times a day, forgive him if he asks for it. He's the God who abides by it. We can constantly go to him with our woundedness and our brokenness asking for mercy and that daily conversion of the heart. It's not a one-shot deal. And I'm, I, for one, am extremely grateful that it's not. He's our Father, and He knows that we're going to need a lot of love and mercy, and that's going to be for out the whole duration of our life. So I would just say to you, don't give up, but run to the Father of mercies, because He loves you. 
uh, a scripture text that I'd like to throw out here just to reemphasize God's mercy for us and our need to face up to our inadequacies. And Father, it comes from 1 John chapter 1 where he says, first, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the mercy that's there just, it's right there. Yeah. It's just our, our ability to take it. And of course, the beauty of our understanding in the Catholic faith is uh, on the one hand, we do just confess our sins and we receive that mercy, but we also have the great sacrament mm. of confession, which yeah. I wonder what your first, <laughs> again, what that was like the first time you did the actual right. sacrament. Oh, I, it was long. <laughs> 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 it really was. But it was, I knew that this is my, my Father God who loves me so much that through all of that, He didn't abandon me. Even when I was stinky in sin, I mean, I was wretched, mm. he was there. Our first email comes from Michael. Uh, Hi, Marcus and Father Callaway. Thanks, Father, for sharing your inspiring story. As a father of two young girls, five and two, what can I do to help them avoid the problems mm. that you ran into? I, I get that question a lot from people. And I would say that because your vocation is fatherhood, I would definitely say that let them see your fatherhood in its brilliance and its fidelity to your wife, to the church, let them see you pray. Pray with them. Mm -hmm. Get down on your knees with your, your daughters. Call them your little princess, patterned off of the princess, Our Lady, the Queen. Mm -hmm. Let them see your, your devotion. When, when I think when young girls see that, they, a lot of women grow up these days with insecurity issues because their father wasn't what he maybe should have been for them and so forth. Let your fatherhood right now shine for them. Mm -hmm. Be the best father, the best faithful Catholic father that you can for them in the way that you talk to your wife. Let them hear the way that you talk to her, about her, in the way that you talk about the church, not speaking against the church, mm -hmm. speaking to her as one that you want to honor, defend, love, and sacrifice for. That'll mean a lot to a girl's heart. All right. Thank you, Father. Let's take our next email. It comes from Brian. He writes, Father, your story sounds much like the life of St. Augustine before his religious conversion. His mother's prayers seem to be a great help in the turnaround of his life. Do you see the same comparison? Thank you for your program. It was a major reason for my conversion from the Baptist Church two years ago. Well, thank you, Brian. God bless you. Welcome home. What about the comparison of Monica and St. Augustine? Absolutely. I sometimes call my mother Monica. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. I think that God in, in his providential plan was saving up the tears of my mother almost as though in a bucket. And you know, my mother went through a lot of pain. I put my mother through a lot of pain. But God was saving it all up, telling her, just wait, you know, just wait. You gave birth to him once. It lasted nine months. It was painful. <laughs> but spiritually, it's going to last longer than nine months. It's going to be a lot more painful. But once he receives new life, you will have forgotten, you know. And so there's no doubt that... Uh, my mom is wonderful. I love my mother. You're, it sounds like your journey pretty well went from being just way out there mm. to an infused touch by God that led you into Catholicism. Did you ever go through the stage of examining all the other faiths that were also out there uh, mm. vying for your attention? Uh, I did a little bit just because uh, I wanted to see what, why are there different churches? Yeah. I didn't understand that. Why, are, why is not everybody Catholic? That didn't make any sense to me. If Jesus founded the Catholic Church, then what's up, <laughs> you know? I mean, that did, I, I've always been pretty logical. And so I started reading things. And then I started reading things about other religions who were claiming other revelations and so forth. And the more I read about them, the more I realized, uh-uh. I mean, this is, this, is, this is what it's all about, right? This has the fullness of it. And that was so clear to me that I never really felt the need to even investigate on a deeper level anything else. All right. We have an email from uh, Zach, Sterling Heights, Michigan. He writes, Father, how did making your first confession help in your love of confession, and how can we lead others to understand the meaning of this great sacrament as well as leading others to come back? Thank you, Zach, for your email. I love to talk about that because when I went to confession for the first time, uh, it was such a cleansing experience for me that it was a unique experience. But now, you know, I have to go to confession all the time. I'm still, you know, finding myself growing and wanting to acquire virtue and finding myself still struggling with vice and habits and so forth. And what I like to consider 
uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession as. And this is a, the, an analogy that's uh, it's weak, but I guarantee that nobody watching right now is going to forget it. Because God is our Father, and we're always children in His sight. Mm -hmm. Confession is like a spiritual diaper change. <laughs> it really is. Imagine if a father said to his kid, you made a mess once, I'm not doing it again. That wouldn't be a father. Mm -hmm. A father is willing to change his kid's stinky diaper day after day after day. How? Through mother. And God our Father does it through mother church. Mm -hmm. This is the family of God. And so it's not a one-shot deal. Daily, we are going to make a mess. We're going to mess things up. It's not magic, it's love mm -hmm. because he's our father. All right, very good. We have another email getting ready for us, even as I speak, although I can't quite see it all on my particular monitor. Are we ready for it here? I think they're working on it. Um, here we go. So, okay, here we go. This comes from Fred. Dear Father, I know that God is calling to me. How do I make myself open to Him and worthy of His call? Thank you, Fred. Wonderful, Fred. That's absolutely wonderful. I would say that the most important thing is heart-to-heart -heart pray. Talk to Him. Read the Scriptures. Listen to what he is saying and how he's speaking to your heart and act upon that. And I would say strongly, go to a Catholic church. Mm -hmm. Walk in and experience the fullness of the household of God. Experience his presence in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Go there and watch what happens. Uh, I think it was Tolkien who said to one of his sons, if you want to find romance in the spiritual life, go before the Eucharist. Okay. It's the key. You had mentioned when you first opened that Marian apparition book mm. that there was a, a, you know, a plethora of language that yeah. didn't make sense. It wasn't yeah. there. What about these apparitions? What are these things? Later, when you looked back, mm. talk about the uh, the powerful message that is in, especially mm. let's say the approved apparitions. Sure. sure. Uh, why has God done that, and what, yeah. what's the message there for us? Well, I think in light of our times, uh, I, I got my licentiate in Mariology, so doing the, the factual studies, the last hundred years or so have seen more Marian apparitions than any other era in the history of the church. And that's because God's house right now is a mess. You know, it can't be destroyed. He made a promise. The church will never be overcome by darkness. But there can be a lot of crazy things going on. And, you know, the mother of God's children, Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, she's not going to abandon us. God's going to give her a special gift for our times because we're living in serious times when so many have been, like myself, deluded and deceived by the world and its strong pull. Mm -hmm. And so God's going to allow Our Lady to come from heaven as our mother to help us to get back, you know, to get back mm -hmm. to the basics, to the foundations, to the fundamentals. And if you look at the approved apparitions, I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Going back to prayer, to reading the scriptures, to fasting, all of those things. It's just the fundamentals, and we yeah. seem to have forgotten them. Yeah, that's a reminder. And it is interesting that most of the approved apparitions involve very innocent children. Yeah. It's right. a reminder to us that Christ told us to be like children. That's right. To be receptive to the graces of God, yeah. even as adults. Exactly. That need for receptivity. Let's assume that somebody's watching possibly right there with maybe not all the things that you were doing, but a few of them right. and wonders, could God love them? Mm. Or why should they come home the same w way that you've done? Right. I would say to them, God is a God of mercy. He's the Father of mercies. There is nothing that we have done or could do that is outside of the shadow of the cross. Mm. Nothing. It doesn't matter what your past is. God loves you. He's pursuing you and He wants you in an intimate relationship. Run to Him. Feel His embrace, His goodness to you, no matter what your experience has been, a fatherhood or so forth. Let Him cover you with His goodness and His mercy and watch you become a new creation. Let's say someone out there isn't familiar with the Divine Mercy. Is there a website they can go to? to sure. The, the best website is run by my community. It's thedivinemercy.org. Okay. It has all the information you need. All right, very good. Father, could we end with your blessing? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your fatherhood. We thank you for your eternal Son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for Our Lady and for the Catholic Church. Bless all those who have watched this program. Help them to receive all the graces you want to give them, to receive all your mercies, all your blessings. And we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Thanks, Marcus. 
I was going to say what a wonderful story, but I know that at times you look back, you almost wish you didn't go through those things, wish your right. mind could be defragged like this our computers. True. But yet it says in Scripture that God comforts us in the ways so that we can comfort others. Yeah. And that's what he did for you. So God bless you and thank you for sharing. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure to be with you. God bless. See you next week.